Introduction to The Little Minister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Little Minister by J. M. Barry. Introductory Essay. J. M. Barry, A Literary and Biographical Portrait. James Matthew Barry was born at Kiramure, Forfarshire, on May 9, 1860. Kiramure, as soberly stated by the Encyclopaedia Britannica, is a borough of barony and a market town of Forfarshire, Scotland. Beautifully situated on an eminence above the glen through which the Gary flows, it lies about five miles northwest of Forfar and about sixty two miles north of Edinburgh. The special industry of the town is linen weaving, for which large power loom factories have recently been built. Mr. Berry has made his birthplace famous as Thrums, after hesitating for a little between that name and Winds, which is the word used in the earliest Old Licht sketches. Thrums has often been pictured by Mr. Berry, the most elaborate description, being probably that contained in the first draft of When a Man's Single. Thrums is but a handful of houses jumbled together in a cup, from which one of the pieces is gone. Through this outlet ran the oney that turned the sawmill wheel and a dusty road twisted out of it to the south fifty years ago when every other room had its hand loom and thousands of weavers lived and died thorus without knowing it the cup overflowed and left several houses on top of the hill the skeletons of some of these shivering dwellings still stand choked in an overgrowth of weeds and currant bushes and occasionally one is occupied by some needy person who during the heavy snowstorms takes a spade inside with him at nights to dig himself out in the morning then he is blown down the hill to his work there were wintry mornings when thrums viewed from the top of the ridge was but two gaunt church steeples and a dozen red stone walls standing out of a snow heap weavers in the second story walked out of their windows instead of down the outside stair that gave them a private door and looking about them for the quarry that was their great landmark fell into buried hen roosts where they sat motionless till they saw what had happened to them the square is thrums heart from it a road to the north climbs straight up the bowl as if anxious to get out of it when most of the houses near this thoroughfare were put up it had not struck the builders to take it into account and many houses were only approachable by straggling paths that doubled round little gardens and became in winter tributaries of the oney there were houses that were most easily reached by scaling dikes the main road comes to a sudden stop at the rim of the bowl short of breath or frightened to cross the common of whin and broom that bars the way to the north with toadstools only to show that this has once been a forest and slippery roots pressing up the turf the ribs of the earth showing over this common one end of which lapping into the valley has been converted into an overflow cemetery there are many cart tracks that in combination would be a road mr barry's father is of an old kiramure stock and a member of the south free church there his mother nay ogilvy was originally an odd licht and is learned in the odd licht traditions both are still living but only a part of mr barry's boyhood was spent in kiramure at an early age he went to dumfries where his brother was inspector of schools he was a pupil in the dumfries academy at that time thomas carlyle was not an infrequent visitor to the town where his sister mr aitken and his friend the venerable poet editor thomas aird were then living the boy often saw carlyle and eagerly heard the gossip about his sayings and doings Carlyle is, we believe, the only author by whom Mr. Barry thinks he has been influenced. The Carlyle fever did not last very long, but was acute for a time. He fervently defended his master against the innumerable critics called into activity by Mr. Froude's biography. Apart from this, Dumfries seems to have left no very definite mark on his mind. The only one of his teachers who impressed him was Mr. Cranstown, the accomplished translator from the Latin poets and he rather indirectly than directly. In the Dumfries papers, Mr. Barry inaugurated his literary career by contributing accounts of cricket matches and letters signed Pater Familius, urging the desirability of pupils having longer holidays. 
he was the idlest of schoolboys and seldom opened his books except to draw pictures on them but he was and is an enthusiast in outdoor games dumfries and the neighborhood have helped him very little in the way of copy gretna green was near and made the subject of an article in the english illustrated magazine and of one and possibly more in the st james gazette at the age of eighteen mr berry entered edinburgh university his brother had studied in aberdeen with another famous native of kirmuir dr alexander white of free st george's edinburgh at aberdeen you could live much more cheaply also it was easier there to get a bursary enough to keep soul and body together till an income could be earned the struggles and triumphs of aberdeen students greatly impressed mr berry who has often repeated the story thus told in the nottingham journal i knew three undergraduates who lodged together in a dreary house at the top of a dreary street two of whom used to study until two in the morning while the third slept when they shut up their books they woke number three who arose dressed and studied till breakfast time among the many advantages of this arrangement the chief was that as they were dreadfully poor one bed did for the three two of them occupied it at one time and the third at another terrible privations frightful destitution not a bit of it the millennium was in those days if life was at the top of a hundred steps if students occasionally died of hunger and hard work combined if the midnight oil only burned to show a ghastly face weary and worn if lodgings were cheap and dirty and dinners few and far between life was still real and earnest in many cases it did not turn out an empty dream in edinburgh university the storm and stress are much mitigated there we understand graduates receive their degrees in evening dress a condition which if it had been insisted upon twenty years ago in aberdeen would have debarred ninety-nine out of every hundred m a s of his college experience mr berry has written in that bright little volume an edinburgh eleven as might have been expected masson was the professor who sent his life off at a new angle he came to masson's classes with a reverence for literature and literary men which the professor did nothing to lessen as he afterwards said there are men who are good to think of and as a rule we only know them by their books something of our pride in life would go with their fall to have one such professor at a time is the most a university can hope of human nature so edinburgh need not expect another just yet in the english literature class mr berry took a high place and he was proxime accessit for the vans dunlop scholarship in english literature he was also interested in professor campbell fraser's class for the rest mr berry was a quiet and fairly industrious student passing his examinations creditably getting through many novels and on the whole enjoying life he made very few friends in his student days the most intimate of these his fellow lodger died young in his edinburgh eleven mr berry says during the four winters another and i were in edinburgh we never entered any but free churches this seems to have been less on account of a scorn for other denominations than because we never thought of them we felt sorry for the men who knew no better than to claim to be on the side of dr macgregor even our free kirks were limited to two st george's and the free high after all we must have been liberally minded beyond most of our fellows for as a rule those who frequented one of these churches shook their heads at the other it is said that dr white and dr smith have a great appreciation of each other they too are liberally minded to contrast the two leading free church ministers in edinburgh as they struck a student would be to become a boy again the one is always ready to go on fire and the other is sometimes at hand with a jug of cold water dr smith counts a hundred before he starts while the minister of free st george's is off at once on a gallop and would always arrive first at his destination if he had not sometimes to turn back he is not only a gladstonian but gladstonian his enthusiasm carries him on as a stream drives the engine mr smith being a critic with a faculty of satire what would rouse the one man makes the other smile of dr white in his first contribution to the british weekly which has not been republished 
Mr. Berry tells us that the inhabitants of Thrums will discuss any topic with you, from the ontology of being to Robert Louis Stevenson's style, but for choice give them the Reverend Dr. White. So many of them told me that he was born there, and asked if I had the privilege of his acquaintance, since they heard I knew Edinburgh, that it became monotonous. So when I saw that any of them was about to speak, I saved him the trouble. I know Dr. White was born here, I said, and I have the privilege of his acquaintance. Nothing is more remarkable about Dr. White than his warm and Catholic literary sympathies, of which Robert Louis Stevenson and many others could speak. None of them could say more than Mr. Barry in summing up his fellow townsman and former pastor. The best cure for dissatisfaction with one's self, I know, is a talk with the pastor of Free St. George's. You could not have it without feeling when you came away that you were an excellent person after all. If I were a minister preaching a sermon on Dr. White, that would be my text. Mr. Barry was a member of Dr. White's famous Bible class, in which the theology of Dante and other deep things are taught, and to every member of which the conductor recently presented a unique volume of Dante notes and pictures. Walter Smith, as he is affectionately called, was also a favorite with the student, though they did not meet personally. There is a sort of Freemasonry among the men who have come under the influence of Dr. Smith. It seems to have steadied them, to have given them wise rules of life that have taken the noise out of them and left them undemonstrative, quiet, determined. You will have little difficulty, as a rule, in picking out Dr. Smith's men, whether in the pulpit or in private. They have his mark, as the rugby boys are marked by Dr. Arnold. Even in speaking of him, they seldom talk in superlatives, only a light comes into their eye, and you realize what a well-founded reverence is. Another Kiramir man occupied at that time a prominent position in Edinburgh, Mr. W. R. Lawson. Mr. Lawson was editor of the now-defunct Edinburgh Current, the organ of the Scottish Tories. The Current, so far as news went, was never a particularly enterprising and successful paper, but from the days of Francis Espinasa, and James Hannay, it had a literary reputation which did not diminish in Mr. Lawson's hands. The literary impulse, however, had hardly moved Mr. Barry then, and all he wrote for the paper was a few miscellaneous criticisms. The bent of his mind, however, was decidedly to literature. In 1882 he graduated, and was for some months in Edinburgh doing nothing in particular. In Masson's class he had made a special study of the Elizabethan satirists, and he thought of writing a book on that subject. In the meantime he saw an advertisement, asking for a leader writer to an English provincial paper. The salary offered was three guineas a week. He made application for this, giving references to Dr. Masson and Dr. White, and found himself in February 1883 installed as leader writer to the Nottingham Journal. He was not editor the work of arranging the paper being in other hands. But he was allowed to write as much as he pleased, and practically what he pleased. Some of his Nottingham experiences are described more or less faithfully in When a Man's Single. His life in that town was very solitary. Outside the newspaper office he had few friends. He wrote often as much as four columns a day, and withal found time to hang heavily on his hands. In the leaders, which are very serious and largely political, it is difficult to recognize his hand, but in other parts of the paper it can be traced easily enough. He wrote an article every Monday, signed Hippomenes, on such subjects as Pretty Boys, Martin Marprelate, Tom Nash, Mothers-in-Law, Waiters, and the like. He also contributed a column of miscellaneous notes every Thursday by a modern peripatetic. The Nottingham Journal apparently did not receive many books for review but the magazines were noticed every month, and occasionally new novels were criticized. Mr. Barry expresses more than once a strong admiration, which he still retains, for the American novelists, George W. Cable, and for the essayist, John Burroughs. Cable, he says, is a novelist who for pathos and delicate character studies is not to be matched on this side of the Atlantic, one who in the age of scribbling can be a poet in prose, who is wise and epigrammatic, as he is elevating and refined, and whose humor is not less than his poetry. The paper, before the end of his connection with it, began to take on a literary touch. The week after he left it relapsed. 
reviewing the nineteenth century his successor declared that an article by dr jessop on the black death contains much information as to the ravages of a disease of a deadly character derived from historical documents of a reliable character it was a very old paper and there were strange eccentricities in the make-up the paper is now we believe amalgamated with the nottingham express the following paragraphs will give an idea of mr barry's early style and journalism the infatuation is as strong as ever and there seems little hope of the spell being broken on the most reliable authority we know that the coldest night of the past year saw one hundred and thirty two thousand seventy six young men in the open air the majority without mufflers round their miserable necks or greatcoats on their ridiculous bodies swearing by the bright moon over their heads that there were never or could be such angelic persons as the one hundred and thirty two thousand seventy six deceivers who accompanied them the candid critic is a gentleman of whom all authors approve when he praises their last volume what i wanted they explain is no gush of praise as from a friend but simply a calm just review slating my work if it deserves slating commending it if it deserves commendation noble fellows then when the critic who is very young in this case observes that the work bears distinct traces of genius is shakespearean without shakespeare's coarseness reminds one of milton in his best moments and suggests tennyson before the poet laureate's hand lost its cunning the author smiles gently to himself and repeats that what he wanted was an honest criticism and he thinks he has got it but perhaps the candid critic is not young or has been eating lobster the night before the book comes in for review what then he quotes a poetaster maybe there is no sacred fire in it nor much of homely sense and shrewd imperfect lines imperfect rhymes false quantities mistaken chimes yet all the feeling good when this is the kind of criticism offered the indignant poet before hanging himself writes a letter to the editor pointing out that his critic is a scoundrel who etc etc in short with ninety-nine out of every hundred authors simple justice means indiscriminate praise a great deal of nonsense will be talked over the queen's book for the next nine days it is said that too many benefits were showered upon john brown but that is nonsense in the new book the queen tells how she presented her attendant on one occasion with an oxidized silver biscuit box which drew tears from his eyes and the exclamation that this was too much god knows it is not is her majesty's remark and i can't see that it was a public meeting friend of my acquaintance used to attend every meeting in his neighborhood for the purpose of calling out hear hear question order and no no and always turned to the newspapers of next day with anxiety to see if his share in the proceedings had been reported where they were attended to he carefully preserved copies of the newspapers and there can be little doubt that this is the most singular case of literary vanity known since the introduction of printing the scene was a law court in paris and an eloquent young advocate was pleading the cause of his client in a way that brought tears to the eyes of many of his hearers the speech was recited from memory, and the pleader had taken the precaution of distributing printed copies among the reporters, so that his speech should be read properly in the morning's newspapers. And now, he exclaimed, I feel myself wholly unworthy to occupy the proud position I hold this day. The onerous nature of the task makes me tremble, lest I should not do my unhappy client justice, and I cry, Would to God that an abler advocate would take my place. Here he faltered, put his handkerchief to his eyes, and seemed overcome with emotion unfortunately one of the reporters did not understand and fearing that the lawyer had forgotten what came next he hurriedly looked up the place in his copy of the speech to prompt him but the tears i see even now he exclaimed in a loud whisper in the eyes of my unhappy client nerve me to the task of course the tables were dissolved in laughter and the eloquent pleader found that an untimely interruption had been sufficient to rob him of a reputation people with blood in their veins no doubt look upon a reception at court as a much more serious thing than the rabble who have to be content with water but even after that is taken into consideration it does seem a trifle ridiculous that the possibility of royal displeasure should be sufficient to break off a match for my own part i am very ready to admit that england has seldom had a better sovereign than the present one 
but as for there being any honour in being received by her at court i don't see it if i saw the whole royal family coming up one street i should glide into another and mean no disrespect to them the glue that keeps the world together is self-esteem it is terrible to think of what might happen did smith sometimes take it into his head that it was not worth his while to try to outdo robinson or brown and life would still be worth living though his income were fifty pounds per annum short of jones's a scotchman held that in the scriptural phrase there were giants in those days the italicized word is a misprint for grants mr aldrich fair slender etc mr h james stout ruddy etc the description reads like a slave dealer's catalogue i remember being invited with a batch of other undergraduates once to assist at a banquet given by a college professor to his private lady students when i know that i am expected to talk to young ladies i prepare some half dozen suitable remarks to fire off at intervals and i was on the point of commencing number one which was no doubt of a frivolous nature to the genius who was placed by my side when she raised her saucer eyes and asked me eagerly whether i did not think that berkeley's immaterialism was founded on anatological misconception i contrived to whisper that such had always been my secret impression then quietly fainted and was sent home to be bled during the last months of his stay in nottingham mr barry had begun to send articles to the london papers the first of these was published by mr stead then editing the pall mall gazette and told how penny dreadfuls were written a much more important step in his career was his introduction to mr greenwood and the st james gazette to mr greenwood he sent an article on an auld licht community the germ of his many writings on that subject it was at once accepted and inserted in the st james's gazette of november seventeenth eighteen eighty four we take a brief extract from this paper scotland had not been long known to me before i reached the conclusion that the score of back-bent poverty-laden natives of the smaller towns whose last years are a struggle with the workhouse almost invariably constitute an auld licht congregation of which a very young man is the minister the first minister ever placed in my auld licht kirk accepted the call as from the mouth of hell according to rumour the natives had a weakness for hot dinners on sunday indeed the backsliding had gone so far that only a boy minister could have accomplished the work of regeneration the little girl who accompanied him was his wife and he proved himself a beardless hero in Auld Licht General Gordon. Nothing in the Auld Licht Kirk, which I used to know so well, affords more food for reflection than the fact that a handful of paupers contrived to make up a salary for a minister. Some articles on other subjects sent to Mr. Greenwood were declined, but a second Auld Licht article was promptly accepted. Mr. Barry thereupon wrote to Mr. Greenwood, asking whether in his judgment he should come to london and venture on a journalistic career mr greenwood wrote that he as yet did not know that his correspondent could do any good work save on the one subject of the odd licks and that he could not therefore advise him to come up the young journalist took his own way he established himself in london early in eighteen eighty five and since then some hundreds of articles by him have appeared in the st james's he wrote on all kinds of subjects, and a few of his articles have been strung together in My Lady Nicotine. Many remain unreprinted. Besides articles, he wrote occasional notes. In Mr. Greenwood he found a kind and wise editor, and a strong friendship has ever since subsisted between the two. To Mr. Greenwood's paper, The Anti-Jacobin, Mr. Barry has contributed from the outset. During the early days of his stay in London, Mr. Barry came to know Mr. Alexander Rache, then of the daily telegraph now editor of the edinburgh evening dispatch the liveliest of the evening papers when mr rache was called up to scotland he showed his characteristic discernment in enrolling mr barry as one of his contributors and from the first number of the evening dispatch down to a comparatively recent period it has contained much work of various kinds from his pen they appeared on wednesdays and saturdays many others form a rather curious comment on the chief events of edinburgh history during those years principal rainey's opinion for instance is an interview by telephone with dr rainey in australia at the time of the dodds election the grand feature of the parnell freedom reveals why bailey walcott is elated 
being after all only a man he is naturally elated at having to announce that more persons regret their inability to be present on this interesting occasion than ever regretted their inability to be present at anything in edinburgh before most of the dispatch articles however have more than a local and temporary interest here for instance are a few i look so young if i were to go back to the place of my boyhood and find that it had forgotten me i would probably fling my hat into the air for joy i have no such luck every other summer or so i return to b for a few days and there are very few persons who know that i have ever been away my greatest trial in b is to meet one of the two miss f's two old maiden ladies who do not seem to realize that the years glide on it was near b that i was at school and the miss f's thought i was still there when i had been for years at edinburgh university always when we meet in high street of b they ask me how i was getting on at the grammar school this year and for a time i explained that i was now in edinburgh they expressed surprise at my going there so young at which i flushed and then the next time we met they asked again how i was liking the grammar school in time i gave them up and when they inquired how i was getting on at the grammar school i merely said that i was liking it very well all this led to a complications for in my last year at edinburgh's the miss f's discovered that i really was at the university and resented my not telling them that i was going they have always felt sure that this last year was my first year at the university and so they puzzle their friends considerably by saying that i took my degree after only being at edinburgh for a few months how i did it no one can make out but i have been told that at the tea parties which the miss f's give the affair is frequently discussed the hostesses going into full details about remembering me quite well as a schoolboy precisely ten months before i graduated the general impression i understand is that i must be exceedingly clever indeed the local paper had a photograph about me being the only case on record of a student who had taken his m a in one session on running after a hat some don't run they pretend to smile when they see their hat borne along on the breeze and glance at the laughing faces around in a way implying yes it is funny and i enjoy the joke although the hat is mine nobody believes you but if this does you good you should do it you don't attempt to catch your hat as it were on the wing you walk after it smiling as if you liked the joke the more you think of it and confident that the hat will come to rest presently you are not the sort of man to make a fuss over a hat you won't give the hat the satisfaction of thinking that it can annoy you strange though it may seem there are idiots who will join you in pursuit of the hat one will hook it with a stick and almost get it only not quite another will manage to hit it hard with an umbrella a third will get his foot into it or on it this does not improve the hat but it shows that there is a good deal of the milk of human kindness flowing in the street as well as water and is perhaps pleasant to think of afterwards several times you almost have the hat in your possession it lies motionless just where it has dropped after coming in contact with a hansom were you to make a sudden rush at it you could have it but we have agreed that you are not that sort of man you walk forward stoop and one reads how the explorer thinks he has shot a buffalo dead and advances to put his foot proudly on the carcass how the buffalo then rises and how the explorer then rises also i have never seen an explorer running after his hat though i should like to but your experience is similar to his with the buffalo as your hand approaches the hat the latter turns over like a giant refreshed and waddles out of your reach once more your hand is within an inch of it when it makes off again there are ringing cheers from the audience on the pavement some of them meant for the hat and others as an encouragement to you before you get your hat you have begun to realize what deer stalking is and how important a factor is the wind there were two rival shoemakers who tried to discover for themselves how to become rich and each wanted at the same time to make the other poor whenever the one sent out handbills in glorification of himself so did the other and in this way they succeeded only in killing each other's efforts which was always something one of them had a son at college and when this youth came home for his vacations his assistance was requested he knew a thing or two and soon his father's shop had a card conspicuous in its windows saying mens est sana which the learned folk said was latin it did not bring new customers to the shop in great numbers 
but it maddened the rival shoemaker who could not rest until he had eclipsed it soon his window bore the still prouder device men's and women's est sena which must have been a pain to the other to read although many of mr barry's articles and particularly the auld licht papers had attracted attention his personality was as yet only known to a very few the editor of the british weekly which had then been published about six months was one day reflecting gloomily on whether it was possible to find a man who could write in a lively way on scottish ecclesiastical affairs he took up the edinburgh evening dispatch and found in it a burlesque account of the inverness assembly of the free church he lost no time in putting himself in communication with the writer and on july first eighteen eighty seven an article appeared on the front page of the british weekly the rev dr white by an outsider it was signed gavin ogilvy and in scotland immediately drew attention to the writer he followed it up by weekly contributions continued during a long period before many months had passed his name and style were well known north and south this was owing simply to the fact that his articles had for the first time a signature in the winter of eighteen eighty seven mr barry issued a humorous little shilling book called better dead the germ of which was to be found in a paper published in the st james's gazette for april twenty first eighteen eighty five suggesting the formation of a society for getting rid of people who would be better out of the way and proposing mr mallock as a good beginning in march eighteen eighty eight a much more important book odd licht idols was published and dedicated to frederick greenwood when mr barry came up to london he had letters of introduction from professor masson to an eminent publisher and to mr john morley he took his odd licht idols to the publisher and was told that although they were pleasant reading they would never be a successful book mr morley then editor of macmillan asked him to send a list of subjects on which he was willing to write the request was complied with but the subjects were returned by mr morley with the singularly uncharacteristic comment that they were not sufficiently up to date mr morley who has since read with great admiration all mr barry's works was much astonished at having this brought to his remembrance the other day odd flicked idols soon made its way when a man's single was published in september eighteen eighty eight dedicated to w robertson nickel the story was originally published in the british weekly but as his manner is mr barry made great changes in revisiting it for publication it was well received and was pronounced by the london daily news as perhaps the best single volume novel of the year it is not at all autobiographical though it gives the author's impressions of journalistic life in nottingham and london perhaps the best parts of it are those devoted to thrums of which george meredith expressed special admiration a widow in thrums was published in may eighteen eighty nine it contained articles contributed to the national observer the british weekly and the st james's gazette together with new matter until the little minister was published it was the most popular of the author's works and it is hard to conceive how he can surpass certain parts of it it has found admirers among all classes of his journalistic humor we may cite the society for providing materials for volumes of reminiscences in eighteen ninety mr barry contributed to the september number of the fortnightly review an article entitled pro bono publico it contained the circular of the above-named society addressed to every writing person over fifty years of age with specimen reminiscences and prices here are one or two of the specimens i saw a great deal of carlyle in those days and what days they were if in a genial mood as was not always the case carlyle was the best of company and strange to say i never think of shaney road now without hearing his loud guffaws ah sage gone into the night since the days when you and i and f and k smoked our churchwardens by the warm fireplace to know you best was to love you most he who can quote you as a cynic forgets the hearty laugh that took all the malice from your vehement utterances it was not a laugh at the expense of those you were speaking of but at your grand honest self that guffaw was the blast with which you blew over the fabrication that your imagination had built riotously and that word last reminds me of carlyle's love for it no i'm not smoking he said on the day i had the memorable pleasure of meeting him for the first time this put me in a predicament 
for there was a pipe in his mouth as he spoke, and he was puffing vigorously. Nevertheless, how could I contradict him while I sat, awed, under the shadow of his personality? Carlyle saw my embarrassment, and, like a true gentleman, at once put me at my ease. Ah, sir, you're a grand sample of the complete idiot, he said, in the winning phraseology that has been so much misunderstood. We didn't have the morrows of you in Scotland, I'm thinking. And then he went on to explain that in his young days people did not speak of smoking, but of blasting, a far more expressive word. He then launched into a magnificent panegyric of tobacco, declaring that to look back to the days when he did not smoke was a humiliation. Smoke as hard as a man may, he said dejectedly, he can never make up for those lost days. Then handing me my hat, in the courtliest manner, he said, and now, young man, be off to your mother. Always be thoughtful of your mother. I guarantee she would miss you more than I do. Thus ended my first meeting with Carlyle. I used to meet Matthew Arnold at various houses, even at Shaney Road, though I question whether he and Carlyle sufficiently appreciated each other. I had the good fortune to be at the famous dinner at B. T. in Hampstead, when Arnold and Mr. Ruskin met for the first time. All who were present on that occasion will remember, thieves broke into the pantry while we were at dinner and made off with some silver spoons. The conversation at dinner was chiefly on this incident. After we had adjourned to the drawing-room, I took an opportunity of asking Mr. Ruskin how he liked Arnold. "'I don't know what to think of him,' the great art critic answered excitedly. "'Mr. Arnold never took his eyes off me during dinner. I was most uncomfortable. Everybody must have noticed it. It even seemed to me that he was looking at me suspiciously.' "'Good heavens! Is it possible that he suspected me of complicity with the thieves?' As it happened, Arnold and I shared a handsome home, and our talk turned to Mr. Ruskin. "'What on earth made Ruskin look at me so fixedly during the dinner?' Arnold asked hotly. "'I never looked up at his eyes were on me. "'My dear sir, he glared at me as if he thought I had those silver spoons in my pocket.' A letter soon arrived at the fortnightly office from a German gentleman, saying that he had been gathering reminiscences of German authors, but could not find enough to make a volume. He therefore desired to order from the society as much as would complete his book. All Mr. Barry's editors are accustomed to get similar epistles from readers without any sense of humor. Most frequently, the writers conceive that there is an occult and improving moral hidden away, and insist on the editor declaring the same. Brought back from Elysium Contemporary Review, June, 1890, describes a colloquy held by five eminent novelists, a realist, a romancist, an Ellesmerian, a stylist, and an American, with the ghosts of Scott, Fielding, Smollett, Dickens, and Thackeray. In reply to criticism, Sir Walter says, when I wrote Ivanhoe, I merely wanted to, to tell a story. Realist. Still, in your treatment of the Templar, you boldly cast off the chains of Romanticism and rise to realism. Elsmerian, To do you justice, the Templar seems to have had religious doubts. Stylist. I once wrote a little paper on your probable reasons for using the word wand in circumstances that would, perhaps, have justified the use of reed. I have not published it. American. I remember reading Ivanhoe before I knew any better but even then I thought it poor stuff. There is no analysis worthy of the name. Why did Rowena drop her handkerchief? Instead of telling us that, you pranced off after a band of archers. Do you really believe that intellectual men and women are interested in tournaments? Sir Walter, you have grown so old since my day. The eminent novelists are equally hard upon Dickens. Dickens, I am a realist. It is true that you wrote about the poor, but how do you treat them? Are they all women of the street and howling ruffians? Instead of dwelling for ever on their sodden misery and gloating over their immorality, you positively regard them from a genial standpoint. I regret to say it, but you are a romancist. Romancist. No, no, Mr. Dickens, do not cross to me. You wrote it with a purpose, sir. Remember Dothaboy's Hall. Elsmerian. A novel without a purpose is as a helmless ship. Dickens, aghast. Then I am an Elsmerian. Elsmerian. Alas, you had no other purpose than to add to the material comforts of the people. Not one of your characters was troubled with religious doubts. 
where does mr pickwick pause to ask himself why he should not be an atheist you cannot answer in these days of earnest self-communion we find mr pickwick painfully wanting how can readers rise from his pages in distress of mind you never give them a chance give me a chair and a man with doubts and i will give you a novel in october eighteen eighty eight mr berry wrote a critical article on george meredith's novels for the contemporary review were i to pick out mr meredith's triumph in phrase-making he says i could tattoo the contemporary with them to use one of his own phrases he has made it his business to pin them to his pages as a collector secures butterflies he succeeds i believe in this perilous undertaking as often as he fails he must have the largest vocabulary of any living man it is told of a great newspaper editor that he had a contributor with a curious craze for introducing the latest thing in felt hats into his articles a hundred times the editor struck the felt hats out and a time came when he dreamed nightly that his contributor had outwitted him mr meredith seems to have similar nightmares about the commonplace and undeniably the phraseology which he offers as a substitute strews the reader's path with stones another of mr berry's critical articles is that on thomas hardy contemporary review july eighteen eighty nine from which we quote the sentence there is a public that compares mr hardy when he is writing of young ladies with the conjurer who brings strange things out of an empty box there are clever novelists in plenty to give us the sentimental aspect of country life and others can show its crueler side some paint its sunsets some never get beyond its pig troughs or its alehouses many can be sarcastic about its dullness but mr hardy is the only man among them who can scour the village and miss nothing he knows the common as mr jeffreys knew it but he knows the inhabitants as well as the common among english novelists of to-day he is the only realist to be considered so far as life in country parts is concerned mr berry's other contemporary articles are baring gould february eighteen ninety and rudyard kipling february eighteen ninety one here it may be proper to say that when mr berry commenced writing on the odd licks he had no conception that they would afford material for more than an article or two but the subject grew on him his maternal grandfather was a main prop of the odd licked kirk and some of the incidents in his stories are probably traditions but there are no actual portraits in the books the rev dr jameson the well-known author of the scottish dictionary had a call at as early an age as the little minister dr jameson whose father was an anti burgher minister in glasgow entered college in his ninth year and the divinity hall in his fourteenth studying four sessions at the first and six at the second at the age of twenty he was licensed to preach and was immediately called by congregations in dundee perth and forfar he was against his own will settled in forfar the tilliedrum of the idols and only a few miles distant from thrums the fact is the ministers of the odd licked kirk in kirimur almost always began their work when very young my lady nicotine reprinted from the st james's gazette was published in april eighteen ninety and although issued later than a window in thrums it is really in point of time almost the first of the author's books the main object in publishing it was to assert his right in the st james's articles which have been attributed to many people he has thought of republishing in the same way his st james's views of a schoolboy mr berry has from the first contributed regularly to the scots observer now the national observer in the speaker he has also written many articles in january eighteen ninety one mr berry commenced a story in good words entitled the little minister which in the opinion of his admirers is his greatest book when published in book form it was received with one burst of acclamation and has proved far more popular than even a window in thrums he is engaged on another thrums book about haggart who is his favorite among his creations it will be almost entirely new very little use being made of what is already published in addition he is engaged in a one-volume story dealing with london life he feels that he has not exhausted thrums and that he has materials there for many more books but there are signs that his mind is turning to london between which and thrums he divides his time 
the three illustrations of this sketch are from photographs depicting the kirk the manse which has been modernized and the window near his own home which suggested to mr barry a window in thrums the etched portrait is from a recent excellent photograph end of j m barry a literary and biographical portrait Chapter One of the Little Minister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Little Minister by J. M. Barrie. Chapter One The Love Light. Long ago, in the days when our caged blackbirds never saw a king's soldier without whistling impudently, Come o'er the water to Charlie a minister of thrums was to be married but something happened and he remained a bachelor then when he was old he passed in our square the lady who was to have been his wife and her hair was white but she too was still unmarried the meeting had only one witness a weaver and he said solemnly afterwards they didna speak but they just gave one another a look and i saw the love light in their een no more is remembered of these two no being now living ever saw them but the poetry that was in the soul of a battered weaver makes them human to us for ever it is of another minister i am to tell but only to those who know that light when they see it i am not bidding good-bye to many readers for though it is true that some men of whom lord rintoul was one live to an old age without knowing love few of us can have met them and of women so incomplete i never heard gavin dishart was barely twenty-one when he and his mother came to thrums light-hearted like the traveller who knows not what waits him at the bend of the road it was the time of year when the ground is carpeted beneath the firs with brown needles when split nuts pat her all day from the beach and children lay yellow corn on the dominie's desk to remind him that now they are needed in the fields the day was so silent that carts could be heard rumbling a mile away all thrums was out in its wines and closes and a few of the weavers still in knee-breeches to look at the new Audlick minister. I was there, too, the dominie of Glen Coharity, which is four miles from Thrums, and heavy was my heart as I stood afar off, so that Gavin's mother might not have the pain of seeing me. I was the only one in the crowd who looked at her more than at her son. Eighteen years had passed since we parted. Already her hair had lost the brightness of its youth, and she seemed to me smaller and more fragile and the face that I loved when I was a hobbledehoy, and loved when I looked once more upon it in thrums, and always shall love till I die, was soft and warm. Margaret was an old woman, and she was only forty-three, and I am the man who made her old. As Gavin put his eager, boyish face out at the carriage window, many saw that he was holding her hand, but none could be glad at the sight as the dominie was glad, looking on at a happiness in which he dared not mingle, margaret was crying because she was so proud of her boy women do that poor sons to be proud of good mothers but i would not have you dry those tears when the little minister looked out at the carriage window many of the people drew back humbly but a little boy in a red frock with black spots pressed forward and offered him a sticky parley which gavin accepted though not without a tremor for children were more terrible to him than bearded men the boy's mother trying not to look elated bore him away but her face said that he was made for life with this little incident gavin's career in thrums began i remembered it suddenly the other day when wading across the wind where it took place many scenes in the little minister's life come back to me in this way the first time i ever thought of writing his love story as an old man's gift to a little maid since grown tall was one night while i sat alone in the schoolhouse on my knees a fiddle that has been my only living companion since i sold my hens my mind had drifted back to the first time i saw gavin and the egyptian together and what set it wandering to that midnight meeting was my garden gate shaking in the wind at a gate on the hill i had first encountered these two it rattled in his hand and i looked up and saw them and neither knew why i had such cause to start at the sight then the gate swung to it had just such a click as mine these two figures on the hill are more real to me than things that happened yesterday but i do not know that i can make them live to others 
a ghost show used to come yearly to thrums on the merry muckle friday in which the illusion was contrived by hanging a glass between the onlookers and the stage i cannot deny that the comings and goings of the ghost were highly diverting yet the farmer of tonohid only laughed because he had paid his money at the hole in the door like the rest of us tonohid sat at the end of a form where he saw round the glass and so saw no ghost i fear my public may be in the same predicament i see the little minister as he was at one and twenty and the little girl to whom this story is to belong sees him though the things i have to tell happened before she came into the world but there are reasons why she should see and i do not know that i can provide the glass for others if they see round it they will neither laugh nor cry with gavin and babby when gavin came to thrums he was as i am now for the pages lay before him on which he was to write his life yet he was not quite as i am the life of every man is a diary in which he means to write one story and writes another and his humblest hour is when he compares the volume as it is with what he vowed to make it but the biographer sees the last chapter while he is still at the first and i have only to write over it with ink what gavin has written in pencil how often is it a phantom woman who draws the man from the way he meant to go so was a man created to hunger for the ideal that is above himself until one day there is magic in the air and the eyes of a girl rest upon him he does not know that it is he himself who crowned her and if the girl is as pure as he their love is the one form of idolatry that is not quite ignoble it is the joining of two souls on their way to god but if the woman be bad and the test of the man is when he wakens from his dream the nobler his ideal the further will he have been hurried down the wrong way for those who only run after little things will not go far his love may now sink into passion perhaps only to stain its wings and rise again perhaps to drown babby what shall i say of you who make me write these things i am not your judge shall we not laugh at the student who chafes when between him and his book comes the song of the thrushes with whom on the mad night you danced into gavin's life you had more in common than with all the lick ministers the gladness of living was in your step your voice was melody and he was wondering what love might be you were the daughter of a summer night born where all the birds are free and the moon christened you with her soft light to dazzle the eyes of man not our little minister alone was stricken by you into his second childhood to look upon you was to rejoice that so fair a thing could be to think of you is still to be young even those who called you a little devil of whom i have been one admitted that in the end you had a soul though not that you had been born with one they said you stole it and so made a woman of yourself but again i say i am not your judge and when i picture you as gavin saw you first a bare-legged witch dancing up wind ghoul rowan berries in your black hair and on your finger a jewel the little minister could not have bought with five years of toil the shadows on my pages lift and i cannot wonder that gavin loved you often i say to myself that this is to be gavin's story not mine yet must it be mine too in a manner and of myself i shall sometimes have to speak not willingly for it is time my little tragedy had died of old age i have kept it to myself so long that now i would stand at its grave alone it is true that when i heard who was to be the new minister i hoped for a day that the life broken in harvey might be mended in thrums but two minutes talk with gavin showed me that margaret had kept from him the secret which was hers and mine and so knocked the bottom out of my vain hopes i did not blame her then nor do i blame her now nor shall any one who blames her ever be called friend by me but it was bitter to look at the white manse among the trees and know that i must never enter it for margaret's sake i had to keep aloof yet this new trial came upon me like our parting at harvey i thought that in those eighteen years my patience had burned like a ship till they sank but i suffered again as on that awful night when adam dishart came back nearly killing margaret and tearing up all my ambitions by the root in a single hour i waited in thrums until i had looked again on margaret who thought me dead and gavin who had never heard of me and then i trudged back to the schoolhouse something i heard of them from time to time during the winter for in the gossip of thrums i was well posted but much of what is to be told here i only learned afterwards from those who knew it best gavin heard of me at times as the dominie in the glen 
who had ceased to attend the old liquor, and Margaret did not even hear of me. It was all I could do for them. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of the Little Minister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Little Minister by J. M. Barry. Chapter Two runs alongside the making of a minister. Long ago, in the days when our caged blackbirds never saw a king's soldier without whistling impudently, come o'er the water to charlie a minister of thrums was to be married but something happened and he remained a bachelor then when he was old he passed in our square the lady who was to have been his wife and her hair was white but she too was still unmarried the meeting had only one witness a weaver and he said solemnly afterwards they didna speak but they just gave one another a look and i saw the love-light in their een no more is remembered of these two no being now living ever saw them but the poetry that was in the soul of a battered weaver makes them human to us for ever it is of another minister i am to tell but only to those who know that light when they see it i am not bidding good-bye to many readers for though it is true that some men of whom lord rintoul was one live to an old age without knowing love few of us can have met them and of women so incomplete i never heard gavin dishart was barely twenty-one when he and his mother came to Thrums, light-hearted like the traveller who knows not what waits him at the bend of the road. It was the time of year when the ground is carpeted beneath the firs with brown needles, when split-nuts pat her all day from the beach, and children lay yellow corn on the dominie's desk to remind him that now they are needed in the fields. The day was so silent that carts could be heard rumbling a mile away. All Thrums was out in its wines and closes, and a few of the weavers still in knee-breeches, to look at the new Audlick minister. I was there, too, the dominie of Glen Coharity, which is four miles from Thrums, and heavy was my heart as I stood afar off, so that Gavin's mother might not have the pain of seeing me. I was the only one in the crowd who looked at her more than at her son. Eighteen years had passed since we parted. Already her hair had lost the brightness of its youth, and she seemed to me smaller and more fragile. And the face that I loved when I was a hobbledehoy, and loved when I looked once more upon it in thrums, and always shall love till I die, was soft and warm. Margaret was an old woman, and she was only forty-three, and I am the man who made her old. As Gavin put his eager, boyish face out at the carriage window, many saw that he was holding her hand, but none could be glad at the sight as the dominie was glad looking on at a happiness in which he dared not mingle margaret was crying because she was so proud of her boy women do that poor sons to be proud of good mothers but i would not have you dry those tears when the little minister looked out at the carriage window many of the people drew back humbly but a little boy in a red frock with black spots pressed forward and offered him a sticky parley which gavin accepted though not without a tremor for children were more terrible to him than bearded men the boy's mother trying not to look elated bore him away but her face said that he was made for life with this little incident gavin's career in thrums began i remembered it suddenly the other day when wading across the wind where it took place many scenes in the little minister's life come back to me in this way the first time i ever thought of writing his love story as an old man's gift to a little maid since grown tall was one night while i sat alone in the schoolhouse on my knees a fiddle that has been my only living companion since i sold my hens my mind had drifted back to the first time i saw gavin and the egyptian together and what set it wandering to that midnight meeting was my garden gate shaking in the wind at a gate on the hill i had first encountered these two it rattled in his hand and i looked up and saw them and neither knew why i had such cause to start at the sight then the gate swung to it had just such a click as mine these two figures on the hill are more real to me than things that happened yesterday but i do not know that i can make them live to others a ghost show used to come yearly to thrums on the merry muckle friday in which the illusion was contrived by hanging a glass between the onlookers and the stage i cannot deny that the comings and goings of the ghost were highly diverting 
yet the farmer of Tanohid only laughed because he had paid his money at the hole in the door like the rest of us. Tanohid sat at the end of a form where he saw round the glass and so saw no ghost. I fear my public may be in the same predicament. I see the little minister as he was at one and twenty, and the little girl to whom this story is to belong sees him, though the things I have to tell happened before she came into the world. But there are reasons why she should see, and I do not know that I can provide the glass for others. If they see round it, they will neither laugh nor cry with Gavin and Babby. When Gavin came to Thrums, he was as I am now, for the pages lay before him on which he was to write his life. Yet he was not quite as I am. The life of every man is a diary in which he means to write one story and writes another, and his humblest hour is when he compares the volume as it is with what he vowed to make it. But the biographer sees the last chapter while he is still at the first, and I have only to write over it with ink what Gavin has written in pencil. How often is it a phantom woman who draws the man from the way he meant to go? So was a man created, to hunger for the ideal that is above himself, until one day there is magic in the air, and the eyes of a girl rest upon him. He does not know that it is he himself who crowned her, and if the girl is as pure as he, their love is the one form of idolatry that is not quite ignoble. It is the joining of two souls on their way to God. But if the woman be bad, and the test of the man is when he wakens from his dream. The nobler his ideal, the further will he have been hurried down the wrong way, for those who only run after little things will not go far. His love may now sink into passion, perhaps only to stain its wings and rise again, perhaps to drown. Babby, what shall I say of you, who make me write these things? I am not your judge." Shall we not laugh at the student who chafes when between him and his book comes the song of the thrushes, with whom on the mad night you danced into Gavin's life you had more in common than with Auld Licht ministers? The gladness of living was in your step, your voice was melody, and he was wondering what love might be. You were the daughter of a summer night, born where all the birds are free, and the moon christened you with her soft light to dazzle the eyes of man. Not our little minister alone was stricken by you into his second childhood. To look upon you was to rejoice that so fair a thing could be. To think of you is still to be young. Even those who called you a little devil, of whom I have been one, admitted that in the end you had a soul, though not that you had been born with one. They said you stole it, and so made a woman of yourself. But again I say, I am not your judge. And when I picture you as Gavin saw you first, a bare-legged witch dancing up wind-ghoul, rowan berries in your black hair, and on your finger a jewel the little minister could not have bought with five years of toil. The shadows on my pages lift, and I cannot wonder that Gavin loved you. Often I say to myself that this is to be Gavin's story, not mine. Yet must it be mine, too, in a manner, and of myself I shall sometimes have to speak, not willingly, for it is time my little tragedy had died of old age. I have kept it to myself so long that now I would stand at its grave alone. It is true that when I heard who was to be the new minister, I hoped for a day that the life broken in Harvey might be mended in Thrums. But two minutes' talk with Gavin showed me that Margaret had kept from him the secret which was hers and mine, and so knocked the bottom out of my vain hopes. I did not blame her then, nor do I blame her now, nor shall any one who blames her ever be called friend by me. But it was bitter to look at the white manse among the trees, and know that I must never enter it. For Margaret's sake I had to keep aloof, yet this new trial came upon me like our parting at Harvey. I thought that in those eighteen years my patients had burned like a ship till they sank. But I suffered again as on that awful night when Adam Dishart came back, nearly killing Margaret, and tearing up all my ambitions by the root in a single hour. I waited in Thrums until I had looked again on Margaret, who thought me dead, and Gavin, who had never heard of me, and then I trudged back to the schoolhouse. Something I heard of them from time to time during the winter, for in the gossip of Thrums I was well posted, but much of what is to be told here I only learned afterwards from those who knew it best. Gavin heard of me at times as the domine in the glen, who had ceased to attend the old liquor, and Margaret did not even hear of me. It was all I could do for them. End of chapter 2 Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State.
Chapter Three of the Little Minister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Little Minister by J. M. Barry. Chapter Three: The Night Watchers. What first struck Margaret in Thrums was the smell of the caddis. The town smells of caddis no longer but whiffs of it may be got even now as one passes the houses of the old where the lay still swings at little windows like a great ghost pendulum to me it is a homely smell which i draw in with a great breath but it was as strange to margaret as the weavers themselves who in their coloured nightcaps and corduroys streaked with threads gazed at her and gavin the little minister was trying to look severe and old but twenty-one was in his eye look mother at that white house with the green roof that is the manse the manse stands high with a sharp eye on all the town every back window in the tenements has a glint of it and so the back of the tenements is always better behaved than the front it was in the front that jamie don a pitiful bachelor all his life because he thought the women proposed kept his ferrets and here too beady hanged himself going straight to the clothes post for another rope when the first one broke such was his determination in the front saunders gilruth openly boasted on don's potato pit that by having a seat in two churches he could lie in bed on sabbath and get the credit of being at one or other gavitt made short work of him to the right-minded the old lick manse was as a family bible ever lying open before them but Beatty spoke for more than himself when he said daggone that manse i never gie a swear but there it is glowering at me the manse looks down on the town from the northeast and is reached from the road that leaves thrums behind it in another moment by a wide straight path so rough that to carry a fraught of water to the manse without spilling was to be superlatively good at one thing packages in a cart it set leaping like trout in a fishing creel opposite the opening of the garden wall in the manse where for many years there had been an intention of putting up a gate were two big stones a yard apart standing ready for the winter when the path was off in a rush of yellow water and this the only bridge to the glebe dyke down which the minister walked to church when margaret entered the manse on gavin's arm it was a whitewashed house of five rooms with a garret in which the minister could sleep if he had guests as during the fast week it stood with its garden within high walls and the roof facing southward was carpeted with moss that shone in the sun in a dozen shades of green and yellow three firs guarded the house from the west winds but blasts from the north often tore down the steep fields and skirled through the manse banging all its doors at once a beech growing on the east side leant over the roof as if to gossip with the well in the courtyard the garden was to the south and was over full of gooseberry and currant bushes it contained a summer seat where strange things were soon to happen margaret would not even take off her bonnet until she had seen through the manse and opened all the presses the parlour and kitchen were downstairs and of the three rooms above the study was so small gavin's predecessor could touch each of its walls without shifting his position every room save margaret's had long lidded beds which close as if with the shutters but was cough fronted or comparatively open with carving on the wood like the ornamentation of coffins where there were children in a house they liked to slope the boards of the closed-in bed against the dresser and play at sliding down mountains on them but for many years there had been no children in the manse he in whose ways gavin was to attempt the heavy task of walking had been a widower three months after his marriage a man narrow when he came to thrums but so large-hearted when he left it that i who know there is good in all the world because of the lovable souls i have met in this corner of it yet cannot hope that many are as near to god as he the most gladsome thing in the world is that few of us fall very low the saddest that with such capabilities we seldom rise high of those who stand perceptibly above their fellows i have known very few only mr carfrae and two or three women gavin only saw a very frail old minister who shook as he walked as if his feet were striking against stones he was to depart on the morrow to the place of his birth but he came to the manse to wish his successor godspeed strangers were so formidable to margaret that she only saw him from her window may you never lose sight of god mr dishart 
the old man said in the parlour. Then he added, as if he had asked too much, May you never turn from him as I often did when I was a lad like you. As this aged minister, with the beautiful face that God gives to all who love him and follow his commandments, spoke of his youth, he looked wistfully around the faded parlour. It is like a dream, he said. The first time I entered this room, the thought passed through me that I would cut down that cherry tree, because it kept out the light. But you see, it outlives me. I grew old while looking for the axe. Only yesterday I was the young minister, Mr. Dishart, and tomorrow you will be the old one, bidding good-bye to your successor. His eyes came back to Gavin's eager face. You are very young, Mr. Dishart? Nearly twenty-one. Twenty-one! Oh, my dear sir, you do not know how pathetic that sounds to me. Twenty-one. We are children for the second time at twenty-one, and again when we are grey and put all our burden on the Lord. The young talk generously of relieving the old of their burdens, but the anxious heart is to the old when they see a load on the back of the young. Let me tell you, Mr. Dishart, that I would condone many things in one and twenty, now that I dealt hardly with that middle age. God himself, I think, is very willing to give one and twenty a second chance. I am afraid, Gavin said anxiously, that I look even younger. I think, Mr. Carfrey answered, smiling, that your heart is as fresh as your face and that is well. The useless men are those who never change with the years. Many views that I held to in my youth and long afterwards are a pain to me now, and I am carrying away from Thrums memories of errors into which I fell at every stage of my ministry. When you are older, you will know that life is a long lesson in humility. He paused. I hope, he said nervously, that you don't sing the paraphrases. Mr. Carfrey had not grown out of all his prejudices, you see. Indeed, if Gavin had been less bigoted than he on this question, they might have parted stiffly. The old minister would rather have remained to die in his pulpit than surrender it to one who read his sermons. Others may blame him for this, but I must say here plainly that I never hear a minister reading without wishing to send him back to college. I cannot deny, Mr. Carfrey said, that I broke down more than once today, this forenoon I was in Tillyloss for the last time, and it so happens that there is scarcely a house in it in which I have not had a marriage or prayed over a coffin. Ah, sir, these are the scenes that make the minister more than all his sermons. You must join the family, Mr. Dishart, or you are only a minister once a week. And remember this, if your call is from above, it is a call to stay. Many such partings in a lifetime, as I have had today, would be too heart-rending. And yet, Gavin said, hesitatingly, they told me in Glasgow that I had received a call from the mouth of hell. Those were cruel words, but they only mean that people who are seldom more than a day's work in advance of want sometimes rise in arms for food. Our weavers are passionately religious, and so independent that they dare any one to help them, but if their wages were lessened, they could not live, and so at talk of reduction they catch fire. Change of any kind alarms them and though they call themselves Whigs, they rose a few years ago over the paving of the streets and stoned the workmen, who were strangers, out of the town. And though you may have thought the place quiet today, Mr. Dishart, there was an ugly outbreak only two months ago, when the weavers turned on the manufacturers for reducing the price of the web, made a bonfire of some of their doors, and terrified one of them into leaving Thrums. Under the command of some chartists, the people next paraded the streets to the music of fife and drum, and six policemen who drove up from Tilliedrum in a light cart were sent back tied to the seats. No one has been punished? Not yet, but nearly two years ago there was a similar riot, and the sheriff took no action for a month. Then one night the square suddenly filled with soldiers, and the ringleaders were seized in their beds. Mr. Dishart, the people are determined not to be caught in that way again, and ever since the rising a watch has been kept by night on every road that leads to Thrums. The signal that the soldiers are coming is to be the blowing of a horn. If you ever hear that horn, I implore you to hasten to the square. The weavers would not fight. You do not know how the Chartists have fired this part of the country. One misty day a week ago, I was on the hill. I thought I had it to myself, when suddenly I heard a voice cry sharply, Shoulder arms! I could see no one, and after a moment I put it down to a freak of the wind. Then all at once the mist before me blackened, 
and a body of men seemed to grow out of it. They were not shadows. They were Thrums weavers drilling with pikes in their hands. They broke up, Mr. Carfrae continued, after a pause, at my entreaty, but they have met again since then. And there were odd licks among them? Gavin asked. I should have thought they would be frightened at our presentor, Lang Tammas, who seems to watch for backsliding in the congregation as if he had pleasure in discovering it. Gavin spoke with feeling, for the presenter had already put him through his catechism, and it was a stiff ordeal. The presentor, said Mr. Carfrae, why, he was one of them. The old minister, once so brave a figure, tottered as he rose to go, and reeled in a dizziness until he had walked a few paces. Gavin went with him to the foot of the manse road, without his hat, as all Thrums knew. I begin, Gavin said, as they were parting, where you leave off, and my prayer is that I may walk in your ways. Ah, Mr. Dishart, the white-haired minister said with a sigh, the world does not progress so quickly as a man grows old. You only begin where I began. He left Gavin, and then, as if the little minister's last words had hurt him, turned and solemnly pointed his staff upward. Such men are the strong nails that keep the world together. The twenty-one years old minister returned to the manse somewhat sadly, but when he saw his mother at the window of her bedroom, his heart leapt at the thought that she was with him, and he had eighty pounds a year. Gaily he waved both his hands to her, and she answered with a smile, and then in his boyishness he jumped over a gooseberry bush. Immediately afterwards he reddened, and tried to look venerable, for while in the air he had caught sight of two women and a man watching him from the dyke. He walked severely to the door, and again forgetting himself was bounding upstairs to Margaret, when Jean, the servant, stood scandalized in his way. I don't think she caught me, was Gavin's reflection, and the Lord preserves, was Jean's. Gavin found his mother wondering how one should set about getting a cup of tea in a house that had a servant in it. He boldly rang the bell, and the willing Jean answered it so promptly, in a rush and a jump, that Margaret was as much startled as Aladdin the first time he rubbed his lamp. Matt's servants of the most admired kind moved softly, as if in constant contact with a minister were galoshes to them, but Jean was new and raw, only having got her place because her father might be an elder any day. She had already conceived a romantic affection for her master, but to say sir to him as she thirsted to do, would have been as difficult to her as to swallow oysters. So anxious was she to please, that when Gavin rang, she fired herself at the bedroom. But bells were novelties to her, as well as to Margaret, and she cried excitedly, What is it? thinking the house must be on fire. There's a carn folk at the back door, Jean announced later, and their respects to you, and will you guide them some water out of the well? It has been drought this awk days, and the bumps is locked. Nah, she said, as Gavin made a too liberal offer, that would tune the well, and there's jimply enough for ourselves. I should tell you, too, that three of them is no old licks. Let that make no difference, Gavin said grandly. But Jean changed his message to a bowl full apiece to old licks, all other denominations one cupful. Ay, ay, said Snecky Hobart, letting down the bucket, and we'll include atheists among the other denominations. The conversation came to Gavin and Margaret through the kitchen doorway. Dinner class Joe Crookshank but me, said Samuel Langlands, the U.P. Na, na, said Crookshanks, the atheist. I'm o'er independent to be religious. I didn't gang to the kirk to cry, O oh, Lord, guy, guy, guy. Take tent o' yourself, my man, said Lang Tammas sternly, or you'll soon be war you would knee for the world for a cup of that cold water. Maybe you're o'er a keen an interest in the devil, Tammas, retorted the atheist. But only way, if it's heaven for climate, it's hell for company. Lads, said Snecky, sitting down in the bucket, we'll send Mr. Dishart to Joe. He'll make another rob do o' him. Speak ma reverently o' your minister, said the presenter. He has the gift. I hin a naturally your solemn raspin' word, Thomas, but in the heart I speak in all reverence. Lads, the minister has a word. I tell you, he prays near like one given orders. At first, Snecky continued, I thought young Lang Candidate was the earnestest of them all, and I didn't deny, but when I saw him with his head bowed like in prayer during the singing, I says to myself, Thou art the man. Ay, but Betsy raxed up her head, and he wasna praying, 
was combing his hair with her fingers on a sly you can find schneck said crookshanks that you said thou art the man to ilk ane o them and just voted for mr dishart because he preached him most i dinna say it to mr urquhart the ane that preached second schneck said it was the lad that gaed through ether ay said susy tibbets nicknamed by haggart the timidest woman because she once said she was too young to marry but i was fell sorry for him just being over anxious he began bonny flinging himself like uninspired at the pulpit door but after henry munn pointed at it and cried out be cautious the snack's loose and he gaed to bits what a coolness henry has though i suppose it was his duty him being kirk officer we didna want a man lang thomas said that could be put out by sich a small thing as that mr urquhart was in sich a rattle after it that when he gies out the first line of the hundred and nineteenth psalm for singing says he and so on to the end hoy that finished his chance the noblest o them to look at said tibby burse was that ain frae aberdeen him that had sich a saft side to jacob ay said snecky and i speered at dr mcqueen if i should vote for him looks like a genius does he says the doctor well then says he dinna vote for him for my experience is that there's no folk such idiots as them that looks like geniuses sal susy said he's a good thing we settled for i enjoyed sitting like a judge upon them so muckle that i sair doubt it was kind of sport to me it was no sport to them susy eyes up hod but it's a blessing we've settled and undoubtedly we've got the pick of them the only thing mr dishart did that made me own easy was his saying the word caesar as if it began with an s he'll startle you mair afore you're done with him the atheist said maliciously i ken the ways that i ministers preachin for kirch all they're cunnin you was a pleased that mr dishart spoke about looms and webs but laffies it was a trick ye'll kind all the young ministers has a sermon about looms for weavin congregations and a second about beatin swords into ploughshares for country places and another on the great catch of fishes for fishing villages that's their stock in trade and just you wait and see if you didna get the ploughshares and the fishes afore the month's out a minister preachin for a kirk is one thing but a minister placed in it may be a very different berry joseph crookshanks cried the presenter passionately none of your dang blasphemy they all looked at wamond and he dug his teeth into his lips in shame oh swear now said the atheist but wamond was quick matthew twelve and thirty-one he said daggone it tammas explained the baffled crookshanks your eye quoting scripture how do you know quote fergus o'connor lads said snecky joe has na heard mr dishart's sermons ay we get it scaldin when he comes to the sermon i ken a thole minister that preaches as if heaven was round the corner if you're hitting at our minister snecky said james cochran let me tell you he's better man than yours a better curler i dare say a better prayer ay he can pray for a black frost as if it was i know the royal family i ken his prayers o oh lord let it hod for another day and keep the snow away will you pretend james that mr duthie could make anything a rob do i admit that rob's awakening was an extraordinary thing and sufficient to gain mr dishart a name but mr carfrae was baffled with rob too james if you had been in our kirk that day mr dishart preached fort ye would be wearying the now for sabbath to be back in it again as ye ken that wicked man there joe crookshanks got rob dow drunken cursin poachin rob dow to come to the kirk to annoy the minister ay he hadna been at that word for ten minutes when mr dishart stopped in his first prayer and gave rob a look i couldna see the look being in the presenter's box but as sure as death i felt it borne through me rob is hard wood though and soon he was at his tricks again weel the minister stopped a second time in the sermon and so awful was the silence that a heap of the congregation could not keep their seats i heard rob breathing quick and strong mr dishart had his arm pointed at him all ah, this time and at last he says sternly come forward listen joseph crookshanks and tremble rob gripped the board to keep himself from obeying and again mr dishart says come forward and sign rob rose shaken and 
tottered to the pulpit stared like a man suddenly shot into the day of judgment you hulking man of sin cries mr dishart not a dick flayed though rob's as big as three of him sit down on the stair and attend to me or i'll step down from the pulpit and run out of the house of god and since that day said hobart rob has worshipped mr dishart as a man that has stepped out of the bible when the carriage passed this day we was discussing the minister and samuel dicky wasn't sure but what mr dishart wore his hat rather far back on his head you should have seen rob my sir he roars there's a shine ra heaven on that little minister's face and them as says there's no has meat effect i will said the u p rising we'll see how rob wears and how your minister wears too i wouldna like to sit in a kirk where they doma sing a paraphrase the psalms of david retorted wamond mount straight to heaven when your paraphrases sticks to the ceiling of the kirk you're a bigoted set tammas woman but i tell you this and it's my last words to you the nicht the day'll come when you'll hae mr duthie ay and even the u p minister preaching in the auld lick kirk and let this be my last words to you replied the presenter furiously that rather than see a u p a preaching in the auld lick kirk i would burn in hell fire for ever this gossip increased gavin's knowledge of the grim men with whom he had now to deal but as he sat beside margaret after she had gone to bed their talk was pleasant you remember mother gavin said how i almost prayed for the manse that was to give you an egg every morning i have been telling jean never to forget the egg ah gavin things have come about so much as we wanted that i am going to trouble it's hardly natural and i hope nothing terrible is to happen now gavin arranged her pillows as she liked them and when he next stole into the room in his stocking soles to look at her he thought she was asleep but she was not i dare say she saw at that moment gavin in his first frock and gavin in knickerbockers and gavin as he used to walk into the glasgow room from college all still as real to her as gavin who had a kirk the little minister took away the lamp to his own room shaking his fist at himself for allowing his mother's door to creak he pulled up his blind the town lay as still as salt but a steady light showed in the south and on pressing his face against the window he saw another in the west mr carfrae's words about the night watch came back to him perhaps it had been on such a silent night as this that the soldiers marched into thrums would they come again end of chapter three recorded by sylvia m b in washington state chapter four of the little minister this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the little minister by j m barry chapter four first coming of the egyptian woman a learned man says in a book otherwise beautiful with truth that villages are family groups to him thrums would only be a village though town is the word we have ever used and this is not true of it doubtless we have interests in common from which a place so near but the road is heavy as tilliedrum is shut out and we have an individuality of our own too as if like our red houses we came from a quarry that supplies no other place but we are not one family in the old days those of us who were of the tenements seldom wandered to the croft head and if we did go there we saw men to whom we could not always give a name to flit from the tannage bray to haggage road was to change one's friends a kirkwind weaver might kill his swine and tilly lost not know of it until boys ran westward hitting each other with the bladders only the voice of the dulceman could be heard all over thrums at once thus even in a small place but a few outstanding persons are known to everybody in eight days gavin's figure was more familiar in thrums than many that had grown bent in it he had already been twice to the cemetery for a minister only reaches his new charge in time to attend a funeral though short of stature he cast a great shadow he was so full of his duties jean said that though he pulled to the door as he left the manse he had passed the currant bushes before it snecked he darted through courts and invented ways into awkward houses if you did not look up quickly he was round the corner his visiting exhausted him only less than his zeal in the pulpit 
from which according to report he staggered damp with perspiration to the vestry where hendry munn wrung him like a wet cloth a deaf lady celebrated for giving out a washing compelled him to hold her trumpet until she had peered into all his crannies with the shorter catechism for a lantern janet dundas told him in answer to his knock that she could not abide him but she changed her mind when he said her garden was quite a show the wives who expected a visit scrubbed their floors for him cleaned out their presses for him put diamond socks on their bairns for him wrapped their hearthstones blue for him and even tidied up the garret for him and triumphed over the neighbours whose houses he passed by for gavin blundered occasionally by inadvertence as when he gave dear old betty davy occasion to say bitterly oh ye ye can sail by my door and gaunt easy's but i'm thinking you would stop at mine too if i had a brass handle on't so passed the first four weeks and then came the fateful night of the seventeenth of october and with it the strange woman family worship at the manse was over and gavin was talking to his mother who never crossed the threshold save to go to church though her activity at home was among the marvels jean sometimes slipped down to the tenements to announce when weary world the policeman came to the door with rob dowsh compliments and if you're wet know me by ten o'clock i'm to break out again gavin knew what this meant and at once set off for rob's you let me gang a bit wid you policeman entreated for till rob sent me on this errand not a soul has spoken to me to-day ay money and i ain't high spoken to but not a man woman nor bairn would fling me a word i often meant to ask you gavin said as they went along the tenements which smelled at that hour of roasted potatoes why you are so unpopular it's because i'm police i'm the first time that has ever been in thrums and the very folk that appointed me at a crown a week looks upon me as a disgraced man for acceptin it's gospel that my own wife is short with me when i've on my uniform though so weel she kens that i would rather hae stuck to the loom if i hadna han a sich queer right leg nobody feels ashamed of my position as i do myself but this is a town without pity it should be a consolation to you that you are discharging useful duties but i'm no i'm doing the harm there's charles dixon says that the very sight of my uniform rouses his dander so muckle that it makes him break windows though a peaceably disposed man till i was appointed and what's the use of their hand a policeman when they winna come to the lock-up after i lay hands on them do they say they won't come say catch them sayin anything they just give me a wop into the gutters if they would speak i wouldna complain from naturally the sociablest man in thrums rob however had spoken to you because he had need o me that was i rob's way converted or no converted when he was blind drunk he would order me to see him safe home but would he crack with me na na weary world who was so called because of his forlorn way of muttering that's a weary world and nobody bides in as he went his melancholy rounds sighed like one about to cry and gavin changed the subject is the watch for the soldiers still kept up he asked it is but the watchers when they let me aside them i'll let you see that for yourself at the head of the rouge for they watch there in the old windmill most of the thrums lights were already out and that in the windmill disappeared as footsteps were heard yard desperate characters the policeman cried but got no answer he changed his tactics a fine night for the time o year he cried no answer but i wouldn't wonder he shouted though we had rain afore morning no answer surely you could gimme me a word for a hint the door you're doin an unlawful thing but i dinna ken what you are you'll swear to that some one asked gruffly i swear to it peter weary world tried another six remarks in vain ay he said to the minister that's what it is to be an unpopular man and now i'll have to turn back for the very eyes that wouldn't let me join them would be the first to complain if i gaed out of bounds gavin found dow at new zealand a hamlet of mud houses whose tenants could be seen on any sabbath morning washing themselves of the burn that trickled hard by rob's son micah was asleep at the door but he brightened when he saw who was shaking him my father put me out he explained because he staffed for the drink and he was fleet he would curse me he hasna cursed me micah added proudly for on odd days come sabbath hearken to him at his loom 
he turned to take his feet off the treadles for fear of running stuck to the drink gavin went in the loom and two stools the one four-footed and the other a buffet were rob's most conspicuous furniture a shaving strap hung on the wall the fire was out but the trunk of a tree charred at one end showed how he heated his house he made fire of peat and on it placed one end of a tree trunk that might be six feet long as the tree burned away it was pushed further into the fireplace and a roaring fire could always be got by kicking pieces of the smouldering wood and blowing them into flame with the bellows when rob saw the minister he groaned relief and left his loom he had been weaving his teeth clenched his eyes on fire for seven hours i was na fleed little micah said to the neighbours afterwards the gang with the minister he's a fine man that he didna call my father names na he said you're a brave fellow rob and he took my father's hand he did my father was shaken after his fecht with a drink and he says ye mr dishart he says if you let me break out nows and nans i could bite struck the tween times but i canna keep sober if i hinna drink to look forward to ay my father prigged sir to get one for a day in the month and he said shine if i die sudden there's thirty chances to one that i gone to heaven so it's worth risking but mr dishart wouldna hear and he cries no by god he cries we'll wrestle with the devil till we throttle him and down him in my father gate on her knees the minister prayed a long time till my father said his hunger for the drink was gone but he says it swells up in me all of a sudden and it may be back afore your hind and come to me at once says mr dishart but my father says na for it would haul me into the public house if it had me at the end of a rope but i'll send the laddie you saw my father crying the minister back it was to give him a tall pound and says my father god help me he says i'll droon myself in the dam rather than let the drink master me but in case it should get hard of me and i should die drunk i would be a mighty gratification to ken that you had the siller to bury me respectable without any help for the poor's rates the minister wasna for taking it at first but he took it when he saw how earnest my father was ay he's a noble man after he gave away my father made me learn the names of the apostles from luke sixth and he says to me miss out bartholomew he says for he did little and put gavin dishart in his place feeling as old as he sometimes tried to look gavin turned homeward margaret was already listening for him you may be sure she knew his step i think our steps vary as much as the human face my bookshelves were made by a blind man who could identify by their steps nearly all who passed his window yet he has admitted to me that he could not tell wherein my steps differed from others and this i believe though rejecting his boast that he could distinguish a minister's step from a doctor's and even tell to which denomination the minister belonged i have sometimes asked myself what would have been gavin's future had he gone straight home that night from dow's he would doubtless have seen the egyptian before morning broke but she would not have come upon him like a witch there are i dare say many lovers who would never have been drawn to each other had they met for the first time as say they met the second time but such dreaming is to no purpose gavin met sanders webster the mole-catcher and was persuaded by him to go home by caddam wood gavin took the path to caddam because saunders told him the wild lindsays were there a gypsy family that threatened the farmers by day and danced devilishly it was said at night the little minister knew them by repute as a race of giants and that not many persons would have cared to face them alone at midnight but he was feeling as one wound up to heavy duties and meant to admonish them severely sanders an old man who lived with his sister nanny on the edge of the wood went with him and for a time they were both silent but sanders had something to say was ye ever at the spittle mr dishart he asked lord rintoul's house at the top of uh, glen Quarty? no i ever looked on a lord no or on all the lord's young leddyship i have hmm. what is she you surely ken that rintoul's auld and is to be married on a young ladyship she's no ladyship yet but they're to be married soon so i may say i've seen a ladyship ay an impressive sight it was yestreen is there a great difference in their ages as muckle as a tween auld peter spens and his wife 
what was sixteen when he was sixty and she was playing at dumps in the street when her man was a-waiting for her to make his porridge ay sich a different doesna suit with common folk but of course earls can please themselves rintoul's so fond of ladyship as is to be that when she was at the school in edinburgh he wrote to her a good day catherine crammy tilled me that and she says since ye are used to it writing letters is as easy as skinning moles i dinna ken what they can write sich a heap about but i dar say he guys her views on the chartist agitation and the potato disease and she'll write back about the romantic sights of edinburgh and the sermons of the grand preacher she hears sal though the grand folk has no religion to speak of for they're an english kirk you know spearing what her ladyship said to me what did she say weel you see there was a dance and ball on and catherine clammy took me to a window where i could stand on a flower-pot and watch the critters whirling around in the ball like teetotums what's mair she pointed out the ladyship that's to be to me and i just glowered at her for thinks i take your fill saunders and where there's lords and ladyships dinna waste a minute on carnals and honourable misses and sich like dirt ay but what put my een blinkin at the blaze o candles i lost it to her till all at once somebody says at my lug well my man and who is the prettiest lady in the room mr dishart it was her ladyship she looked like a star mm, and what did you do the first thing i did was to fall off the flower-pot but china came too and says i with a polite smirk i'm taking your ladyship says i as you're the bonniest yourself i see you're a cute man sanders ay but that's noah she launched in a pleased way and tapped me with her fan and says she why do you think me the prettiest i dinna deny but what that staggered me but i thought a minute and took a look at the other dancers again and sign i says mighty sly like the other ladies i says has she small feet sanders stopped here and looked doubtingly at gavin i canna make up my mind he said whether she liked that for she rapped my knuckles with her fan fell sair and off she gaed i i consulted thomas haggart about it and he says the flirty critter he says what would you say mr dishart gavin managed to escape without giving an answer for here their roads separated he did not find the wild lindsays however children of whim of prodigious strength while in the open but destined to wither quickly in the hot air of towns they had gone from caddam leaving nothing of themselves behind but a black mark burned by their fires into the ground thus they branded the earth through many counties until some hour when the spirit of wandering again fell on them and they forsook their hearths with as little compunction as the bird leaves its nest gavin had walked quickly and he now stood silently in the wood his hat in his hand in the moonlight the grass seemed tipped with hoar-frost most of the beeches were already bare but the shoots clustering round them like children at their mother's skirts still retained their leaves red and brown among the pines these leaves were as incongruous as a wedding dress at a funeral gavin was standing on grass but there were patches of heather within sight and broom and the leaf of the blaeberry where the beeches had drawn up the earth with them as they grew her roots ran this way and that slippery to the feet and looking like disinterred bones a squirrel appeared suddenly on the charred ground looked doubtfully at gavin to see if he was growing there and then glided up a tree where it sat eyeing him and forgetting to conceal its shadow caddam was very still at long intervals came from far away the whack of an axe on wood gavin was in a world by himself and this might be someone breaking into it the mystery of woods by moonlight thrilled the little minister his eyes rested on the shining roots and he remembered what had been told him of the legend of caddam how once on a time it was a mighty wood and a maiden most beautiful stood on its confines panting and afraid for a wicked man pursued her how he drew near and she ran a little way into the wood and he followed her and she still ran and he still followed until both were forever lost and the bones of her pursuer lie beneath a beech but the lady may still be heard singing in the woods if the night be fine for then she is a glad spirit but weeping when there is a wild wind for then she is but a mortal seeking a way out of the wood the squirrel slid down the fir and was gone the axe's blows ceased nothing that moved was in sight 
the wind that has its nest in trees was circling around with many voices that never rose above a whisper and were often but the echo of a sigh gavin was in the cadam of past days where the beautiful maiden wanders ever waiting for him who is so pure that he may find her he will wander over the treetops looking for her with the moon for his lamp and some night he will hear her singing the little minister drew a deep breath and his foot snapped a brittle twig then he remembered who and where he was and stooped to pick up his staff but he did not pick it up for as his fingers were closing on it the lady began to sing for perhaps a minute gavin stood stock still like an intruder then he ran towards the singing which seemed to come from windigool a straight road through caddam that farmers use in summer but leave in the back end of the year to leaves and pools in windigool there is either no wind or so much that it rushes down the sieve like an army entering with a shriek of terror and escaping with a derisive howl the moon was crossing the avenue but gavin only saw the singer she was still fifty yards away sometimes singing gleefully and again letting her body sway lightly as she came dancing up the windy ghoul soon she was within a few feet of the little minister to whom singing except when out of tune was a suspicious thing and dancing a device of the devil his arm went out wrathfully and his intention was to pronounce sentence on this woman but she passed unconscious of his presence and he had not moved nor spoken though really of the average height she was a little thing to the eyes of gavin who always felt tall and stout except when he looked down the grace of her swaying figure was a new thing in the world to him only while she passed did he see her as the gleam of colour a gypsy elf poorly clad her bare feet flashing beneath a short green skirt a twig of rowan berries stuck carelessly into her black hair her face was pale she had an angel's loveliness gavin shook still she danced onwards but she was very human for when she came to muddy water she let her feet linger in it and flung up her arms dancing more wantonly than before a diamond on her finger shot a thread of fire over the pool undoubtedly she was the devil gavin leapt into the avenue and she heard him and looked behind he tried to cry woman sternly but lost the word for now she saw him and laughed with her shoulders and beckoned to him so that he shook his fist at her she tripped on but often turning her head beckoned and mocked him and he forgot his dignity and his pulpit and all other things and ran after her up windy ghoul did he pursue her and it was well that the preacher was not there to see she reached the mouth of the avenue and kissing her hand to gavin so that the ring gleamed again was gone the minister's one thought was to find her but he searched in vain she might be crossing the hill on her way to thrums or perhaps she was still laughing at him from behind a tree after a longer time than he was aware of gavin realized that his boots were chirping and his trousers streaked with mud then he abandoned the search and hastened homeward in a rage from the hill to the manse the nearest way is down two fields and the little minister descended them rapidly thrums which is red in daylight was grey and still as the cemetery he had glimpses of several of its deserted streets to the south the watchlight showed brightly but no other was visible so it seemed to gavin and then suddenly he lost the power to move he had heard the horn thrice it sounded and thrice it struck him to the heart he looked again and saw a shadow stealing along the tenements then another then half a dozen he remembered mr carfrae's words if you ever hear that horn i implore you to hasten to the square and in another minute he had reached the tenements now again he saw the gypsy she ran past him half a score of men armed with staves and pikes at her heels at first he thought they were chasing her but they were following her as a leader her eyes sparkled as she waved them to the square with her arms the soldiers the soldiers was the universal cry who is that woman demanded gavin catching hold of a frightened old man curse the egyptian limmer the man answered she's egging my laddie on to fecht bless her rather the son cried for warning us that the soldiers is coming put your ear to the ground mr dishart and you'll hear the dirl o their feet the young man rushed away to the square flinging his father from him gavin followed as he turned into the school wind the town drum began to beat windows were thrown open and sullen men ran out of closes where women were screaming and trying to hold them back 
at the foot of the wind gavin passed sanders webster mr dishart the mole catcher cried ha you seen that egyptian may i be struck dead if it's no her little ladyship but gavin did not hear him End of chapter four recorded by sylvia m b in washington state